Welcome to Season 3, Episode 19 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to share the second part of my story on how I transitioned from being a classroom teacher to working as an instructional coach, curriculum designer, and educational consultant. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. Now, if you missed last week's episode, I encourage you to go back and check that out first. Episode 18 shares details of how I first got started in education and began my career as an entrepreneur, and I share some things that I've never shared publicly before. So definitely start with that episode if you want to know how I began building a professional reputation for myself online and made that initial transition out of the classroom. In today's episode, I'm going to pick back up with the story in 2012. At that point, I had been doing instructional coaching and educational consulting for a couple of years. I'd published three books, two of which were written back to back. It had completely drained me, and it was a little frustrating that I had devoted three years of my life to writing books that I was only making a couple of dollars off of. I mean, this is something that the general public doesn't always realize. The author of a book is lucky to get two, three, maybe four dollars per copy sold. My margins were a little higher since I owned the publishing company, but let's just put it this way. The only authors who make enough money and book royalties to support their families are the New York Times bestsellers, who make up for the low price point by selling in massive volume. It's very hard to support a family as an author alone. So although it was exciting and prestigious to write books, and they did give me one revenue stream, it wasn't a major one. And I just didn't have it in me to keep dedicating hundreds of hours to write a book and then undergoing the equally arduous task of publishing it and marketing it, especially since I still didn't really know what I was doing as far as marketing and trying to spread the word about my resources. I did not think of myself as a salesperson and I just didn't know how to sell my books. I just wanted a break from the whole process of writing and publishing. I was still focusing on creating resources for teachers and sharing them online, But the blog was not a business. That was still a hobby. The main way I was earning money in 2012 was through my work as a consultant for BrainPop and through instructional coaching in schools. I still wanted to find a way to scale up somehow and to make a bigger impact on education. I'd heard from some of my friends online about this site called TeachersPayTeachers.com, where you could create curriculum resources and sell them directly to other teachers. I reached out to both Charity Preston of the Organized Classroom and Laura Candler of Teaching Resources just to introduce myself, and to my surprise, they'd heard of my work and they'd read my blog. Those two ladies gave me some powerful advice and really opened my eyes up to a whole new world of helping teachers and being able to support my family while I was at it. Charity invited me to a Facebook group for TPT sellers where I made friends with hundreds of teacherpreneurs. I observed my new friend's experience with TPT for about a year before I even thought about making anything myself. I wanted to be sure that it was something worth getting into and that I was able to do it with intention and focus and a big picture strategy. I'm not the type of person to just throw random stuff into a storefront and hope to make a few bucks. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. So I spent 2012 planning everything out. My logo, my product creation schedule, my cover page templates, everything. And I tried to do a really professional job with my store right from the start. Now, of course, all that looked dated and it looked terrible within two years and all needed to be redone. But that's the nature of the business. I began my TPT journey with revamping materials that I'd used in my own classroom. And then I started um, selling the things that I was creating as an instructional coach and giving to the teachers that I worked with in schools. Everything about that just felt right to me. Because remember, I'd been creating all my own curriculum resources since 1999. It's what I loved doing. And finally, the internet had evolved to a place where it was easy to find great graphics and fonts and create really beautiful looking resources. So I updated all my teacher forms and I took the plain center materials and games that my students had used and I made them colorful and engaging and 
also a bit more rigorous to align with the Common Core standards, which had just been released. I adapted everything so that it would make sense for other teachers' classrooms, and I wrote out lengthy instructions on how to use my products. When I ran out of my own classroom and coaching materials, I started using my blog readers' questions and their feedback to inspire new content and more resources to share. That was my entire approach to TPT back then, and even to this day, I continually listen to teachers' needs and then create resources to meet those needs. My TPT store did very well right away. Now, that's not really the norm for most TPTers, so I don't want to give you the idea that anyone can just throw a couple of $5 products in a storefront and become an overnight success. Remember, I had already been earning teachers' trust for nearly a decade online at that point. So it was much easier to get my products in front of people. I was able to go back into older web pages and blog posts and embed new products that were naturally related to the blog topic. So I was sharing ideas with tons of value on their own, and then anyone who wanted easy-to-use resources could simply click through to my store and purchase what they needed. I absolutely loved creating things for Teachers Pay Teachers, and I still do. I also loved being the educational content creator for BrainPop. That's what my part-time role there had evolved into. Um, as by this point, I was taking charge of the lesson plans and also contributing to the blog and social media accounts for the company. I also loved doing instructional coaching. But this is me we're talking about, and I always like to have new challenges. One of my favorite things is going to education conferences to learn and to connect face-to-face with other educators. But I always went as a learner. Year after year after year, I'd just sit in the audience and soak up as much wisdom as I could and share what I learned on my blog and social media. But people kept telling me, Angela, you need to be presenting. You need to be up there on that stage sharing too. And I kind of resisted that, partially because of stage fright, but mostly just because I'm an introvert. I'd rather be creating stuff and working alone on my computer or writing than standing up in front of a group of people, especially a group of adults. But my friends pushed me on this, in particular, Lisa Dabbs, Amber Tiemann, and Aaron Klein. They were all saying the same thing, and I knew they were right. Writing stuff on a blog or a book can make an impact, but being face-to-face, that's powerful on an entirely different level. I guess my friends believed in me a little more than I believed in myself, which is why those ladies are so dear to me. I still needed to get to a place where I was comfortable with getting on that stage in front of my peers. I'd been getting speaking requests for years, mostly from teachers who loved my books or my blog and told their districts about me but I turned most of those opportunities down. But throughout 2013 and 2014, I dialed back on that local work doing instructional coaching in schools, and I dialed back on the Teachers Pay Teachers product creation, and I started saying yes to more speaking. I did this because I wanted a new challenge. People had been asking me to speak, and it's something that I knew I wanted to get good at and that would really help teachers. But the main reason why I gathered up the courage to start speaking was because I finally had a clear message that I was passionate enough about to take that risk and put myself out there for that message. I also started writing a book on that topic. Now, the book, I didn't really want to write if I'm honest about it because I knew how much work it was going to be. But when a writer gets the inspiration for a book, it doesn't really feel like a choice. It's never really if you're going to write the book, but when. That fire and passion for the book will just burn inside of you until you finally cooperate and start letting the words flow out and flow through you. There's really no other option. It had been two years at that point since I'd written a book, and this one was just burning inside me. It was a book that I really wanted to have in existence. This was a book about the one thing that I kept getting asked about, but had no resources for. And that was helping teachers enjoy their work. There are tens of thousands of teachers out there who used to love their jobs, who want to love their jobs, but just can't anymore because teaching has been turned into a different profession than what they signed up for. It is hard to find the joy in teaching when you're just testing, 
or just managing behavior, or parents are constantly disrespecting you, or your administrators don't support you. These are the kinds of issues that I can't really fix, but I wanted some sort of guide to help teachers create daily habits that would help them push past all of that nonsense and stay focused on what makes the job of teaching really worth it. Such a book did not exist, so I started writing it. And before I even finished, I created a keynote presentation on the topic because once I had the three core ideas formulated, it was a message that I wanted to start spreading right away. There were teachers out there who were going to quit their jobs at the end of the school year in 2014. They couldn't wait until 2015 for me to have the book finished. It was going to be too late. So I took a break from writing the book and I went all around the country delivering my presentation at schools and conferences. And it worked out exactly the way it was supposed to be because I used the struggles that I was hearing from teachers at these live events to help me solidify what to put in the book. In March 2015, I published Unshakable, 20 Ways to Enjoy Teaching Every Day, No Matter What. Now, it didn't fly off the shelves right then, despite me trying a book launch strategy that was supposedly foolproof. So once again, Angela, not the genius marketer, trusted her gut and just did what I knew how to do and did what I loved. And I ran an online book club in July 2015, just like the book clubs that I'd run in the past for my other books and that I continue to run to this day, each summer, each winter. And in that book club, Unshakable resonated with teachers right away. They started recommending it to other teachers and it really picked up steam. Unshakable is the only book I've written that took off immediately rather than slowly gaining traction over time. It was just incredible to hear the the stories of just countless teachers who said, this book kept me from quitting my job. I was able to stay in this profession and connect with the reason why I teach and love what I do again. Many of them then went on to read my previous books and dig even deeper into that mindset piece. It was just unbelievable to see their testimonies. I spent most of the summer of 2015 just in shock, just feeling incredibly grateful for being able to do the work I loved and helping others love their work too. Since the book was doing well, it was a natural time to do more speaking around it. But honestly, at that point, I was ready to close the door on that aspect of my work and focus on other challenges. I had a new desire burning in my heart and I didn't feel like I could do everything I wanted to and still have balance in my life. I knew on some level that something different was going to happen, and I started phasing out the speaking just before Unshakable was published. The idea for my new venture stemmed from an offhand comment that I'd heard from a teacher who had attended an event I'd spoken at. You see, you never know the power of your words and how just one sentence spoken, you don't even think it means anything, could touch and inspire someone and actually change their whole life. She said that she'd been reading my website and my books for years, and it was so crazy to finally hear my voice for the first time. She said that anytime she read something that I wrote from now on, she'd be able to hear it in my voice as she read. And that was a real light bulb moment for me. I was an avid podcast listener myself, and I knew how powerful audio is as a form of connecting the listener and the speaker. So I took that next leap out of my comfort zone and I started the Truth For Teachers podcast back in January 2015. I don't really like the sound of my own voice. I guess most people probably feel like that. They don't like how they sound, but I really wanted to do the podcast. It just seemed like a great way to serve teachers and it wasn't going to cost them anything. I had started to feel like all my best stuff was now behind a paywall. You had to pay for my books or pay for my teaching resources on TPT or pay to go to a conference to hear me speak. And my blog content, my free stuff was being neglected because I didn't have time for it. So the podcast was a way to make sure my blog had great content and to focus on giving back to teachers and encouraging them and inspiring them every single week for free. It was also a way for me to feel like I was sharing my heart with teachers on a deeper level and having a more personal connection through my voice rather than just through my writing. So the podcast in many ways 
was designed to help me phase out the speaking events while still maintaining those personal connections. It was a way to scale personal connection as much as something like that is possible. I could spend three hours developing an episode and literally hundreds of thousands of teachers would benefit from it due to the popularity of my blog. Contrast that with dedicating three exhausting days to travel across the country for a conference and only get to speak to maybe 1,500 people at most. So I started the podcast just before Unshakable was published. I spent November and December 2014 researching podcasts and planning everything out. You know, I like to be very strategic. And I launched in January 2015, just two months before Unshakable was published. And by the time the summer rolled around, I had completed 99% of my speaking obligations and I wasn't taking on anymore. The truth was, I was tired. My husband and I had both had some health issues and that also forced me to take a step back and really analyze my priorities and how I wanted to spend my time. I also, despite the success and despite feeling like I was making that bigger impact on education that I wanted to be, I somehow felt like I had hit a ceiling in my business. I had all these great ideas of things that I wanted to do for teachers, but no way to do them all because I'm just one person. If I wanted to maintain my same amount of work hours, then that was as successful as I would ever be. That was probably the biggest reach I'd ever have. The only way to change that and to increase my productivity and my impact was to stop trying to do it all myself and start building a team. Now, keep in mind that for the first 13 years of me running my website and running what had somehow evolved into my own business, I literally did everything myself. And there's so much more than even what I shared here. I maintain a 10,000 member Facebook group called Encouraging Teachers. I run my own Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. I respond to all my own email. And this is on top of maintaining my website and writing all the content for my blog. Every image, every sidebar, every SEO optimization, everything was done by me. And it was very hard to let go and to accept my own limitations. But the moment I started researching ways to get help, the possibilities just opened up. I have a small part-time team of freelancers behind me now that really make everything I do possible. I got help with scheduling out some posts on Pinterest and Twitter. I got a web developer who could fix bugs on my website in an hour instead of me having to spend my entire day bungling through and making the problem worse. I got a sound engineer to help with the podcast episodes and make sure everything sounds right. I got an editor who helps me proofread and format my content and all sorts of things like that. I got a graphic designer who makes the designs on the teacher t-shirts that I started selling in 2014. Most of these people just work on an as-needed basis. I don't have employees. I don't have any kind of full-time help, although I would love to move in that direction in the future. But for right now, I have some great people that I can turn to when I need help with occasional projects and some great people that have helped me automate part of my business so I can focus on what I really love to do, which is creating awesome stuff for teachers. And the people on my team are the ones who are helping me with my current project, which wouldn't be possible at all without them. Yes, there is one more thing that I do that I haven't mentioned to you yet. You see, true to form, I saw another gaping need for teachers and felt compelled to create a solution for it. This is at the end of summer 2015, so just a few months ago. I had the Cornerstone book, which helps teachers with the management piece of running a classroom. I had Awakened in the Devotional, which helped with the mindset and stress management piece. And I had Unshakable, which was designed to help make teaching fun and enjoyable again. But none of those resources solve the problem of teachers working 60 to 80 hour weeks and still feeling like they hadn't done enough. There was just nothing out there for the teacher who stays up until 2 a.m. grading every night or spends hours surfing the internet looking for lesson ideas because her school only provides a boring textbook. I mean, sure, there's resources that help with those problems, but I wanted to offer a comprehensive solution 
a support system so teachers would be guided through the process of re-examining every aspect of their work and figure out how to streamline and simplify it. Work-life balance is not as simple as deciding you're just going to leave at 4 p.m. and what doesn't get done doesn't get done. And there's some people who can do that. Most people, it's not that easy. For most people, it takes a really reflective, thoughtful approach to teaching so that you know you're doing the things that matter most and letting go of the things that don't. Teaching is not a job that you can do halfway and feel good about it. So I wanted to address the mindset shifts that are critical in achieving work-life balance to help teachers identify the aspects of their work that had the biggest impact on student learning and pour their energy into those things while eliminating, automating, or delegating the rest. I wanted to help them empower their students to take ownership of the learning and empower kids to take ownership of how the classroom runs so that the entire burden of keeping things going smoothly doesn't just fall on the shoulders of the teacher. Now, that was a big problem that I was trying to solve, and I knew I did not want to write another book. I also knew that this problem couldn't be solved with a, with a book alone. It really needed a more comprehensive solution, but I didn't know what else to do. This was a project that I'd actually been adding to occasionally for years. I had 250 pages written just in a rough outline. And I still wanted to add forms, templates, printables, video, audio, make it a really interactive experience. If I put it all together, it probably would have been like a 1,000 page interactive ebook. No one is going to buy a 1,000 page book. And more importantly, no one is going to dig through all that and use it. I knew this was going to be a massive project that would consume hundreds and hundreds of hours of my time, and I wasn't going to put my heart and soul into something that teachers weren't actually going to benefit from. I knew they needed the content shared with them in small, manageable chunks so that they had time to digest it and to try implementing it, and that they needed support. This is how I came to create the 40-Hour Teacher Workweek Club. To be honest, I went back and forth on the name and drove everyone around me crazy as I questioned it. I felt like it could be misconstrued and maybe sound like I was advising teachers to be lazy and do nothing more than what their contract stated. But again and again, the teachers that I asked about the title said they really liked it. They got it. They knew what I meant. They knew the club was about working smarter, not harder. So I added the tagline, Daily Hacks to take your weekends back. And I launched in October 2015. The club has changed everything for me. It's the biggest, most important, and most profitable thing that I have ever done professionally. And by no coincidence, it's also the most impactful thing I've done professionally. For more than a decade, I've gotten daily emails from people saying that My blog posts or podcasts or books help them in really profound ways. And I've read reviews of my books saying that they were life-changing. It's just humbling and it's an honor every time I read those words. But this club has made an impact on a level that I, I couldn't even begin to imagine. In fact, if I had known, I probably would have been too scared to even try it. The club or probably more accurately, teachers' commitment to the principles of the club is literally saving marriages. It's restoring strained relationships because teachers' children and family members have been resentful of how much time grading papers and planning lessons has stolen away from their family. It's improving the physical health of teachers who finally have time to exercise and rest and prepare healthy meals. It's allowing teachers to use their weekends and their holiday breaks to stop thinking about school without feeling behind when they go back to work. The club is saving teachers sanity. Now, it isn't having that kind of impact on every member, of course. We have members who have seen just a little improvement in their work-life balance, shaving maybe three hours off their work week or even just feeling like they're able to work more productively and cut out inefficient and draining time wasters. I always tell these members that they should be super proud of their work and their results because that's 12 hours a month that they have for other priorities. 
Some of these members have extremely demanding teaching positions where streamlining their workload enough to have a couple extra hours a week is a massive accomplishment. Many of them start to give up on themselves, but then they create a 15 to 20 minute weekly habit of checking out the new strategies and choosing just one to implement. And they will immediately start seeing results when they do that. And that motivates them to stick with it. So success with the club is not universal. In terms of achieving work-life balance, it depends on the individual's commitment to making the mindset shifts and being honest in their reflection on their teaching practices and being willing to try out different productivity strategies. But the people who are determined to create change are doing it and they're doing it in the most inspiring ways. Literally every single day in the club's Facebook group, I'm reading success stories from teachers who are seeing the results of their hard work pay off, who've made a series of small changes that really do add up to big results. So much so that that has actually become the informal motto of the club. Small changes add up to big results. Each week, our members layer on just one new strategy or one new mindset shift, and that brings them a step closer to that work-life balance that they crave. I've debated a lot about the price of the club. It's like a course, so you can't just join any time. You'd be lost if you hopped in in the middle. So it's only open twice a year to new members in January and July. And in January, I sold it for a one-time payment of $99 for the entire year-long program. And that includes online access to the private discussion community on Facebook, including after the year is up, so that members don't lose the connections and relationships they've built after they graduate from the club. It's really a small amount of money for 52 weeks worth of productivity strategies, plus hundreds of dollars worth of printables and ready-to-use forms and teaching resources and the support of Facebook and the Facebook group. It's also a small amount of money, more importantly, for the results. I mean, a program that shows you how to take back 10 plus hours a week of your life, that's a steal for $99. And I've even set it up so that there are monthly and quarterly payment options because I know that a lump sum is tough on a teaching salary. I've had a lot of people advise me to double or even triple the price, especially when they find out how much it costs me to run it. I have to pay an editor, a formatter. I have to pay co-moderators for both the elementary Facebook group and the secondary group. I have payment processing fees, hosting fees. I pay for customer service help to answer the emails. And I pay for ongoing custom web development to get it all set up and maintained. The club is really a massive and very expensive project to take on. From a business standpoint, and I have to look at it that way too, because I'm now spending full-time hours working on the club. I'm saying no to almost all other opportunities that could help pay my family's bills every month. So profitability has to be a consideration. The reason though why I ultimately decided to price below what the club is worth is because my goal is to help as many teachers as possible with this. It really comes back to my vision for the club. I choose to serve more teachers by pricing it low and doing my best to hire other people to help me manage everything so I can serve those teachers as best as possible in a large group, rather than charging more and serving fewer teachers. I went with that because my vision for the club is helping teachers get their lives back and I don't want to leave anyone out of that. But in the back of my mind, I haven't lost sight of the fact that if there were fewer teachers, I could serve them better. I can offer much more personalized coaching in a group of, say, 50 versus a group of 3,000. So, true to form, of course, I've started looking ahead to the next challenge and my next project to support teachers. This is only in the beginning stages right now. I've never talked about this publicly. Only a handful of people in my life even know that I'm thinking about this. It's just something that I'm still daydreaming about and just jotting down furious notes um, whenever the inspiration strikes. But it's going to be some sort of special opportunity just for graduates of the 40-hour Teacher Workweek Club, just for people who have completed that full one-year program and are super committed to working efficiently and bringing their lives into balance. It's going to be like an advanced program that tackles issues beyond just productivity in the classroom, but also applies these principles at home 
and in every other aspect of life. It's going to be a much smaller, much more exclusive group where I'm able to get to know each member well and I can offer true mentorship and coaching. I can't really share anything more specific right now because I don't know yet. (laughs) And like everything else I do, it's going to be built in conjunction with teachers, getting their feedback and focus on creating something that serves them and meets their needs. It could go in a completely different direction. It's hard to say at this point, but that's where my vision is. I can also see myself offering more support to teacherpreneurs in the future as well. I already have two online courses for that purpose. One is called How to Transition into Educational Consulting. And one is called Expand Your Brand, Turn Ideas and Expertise into Teacherpreneur Success. And I have a third course that's coming out in late summer. I really do enjoy helping other teachers build their entrepreneurial businesses, but for now, I want to keep my focus on helping teachers love their work in the classroom and make a real difference for kids while still taking care of themselves. I still have a lot of work to do in creating resources for that, and I'm not going to stop until I feel like I've contributed everything I can to that mission and that purpose. So that's where my story ends for now. I really want to say thank you to everyone who has listened all the way through. I've actually never told that whole story in its entirety before, and I still feel like I've left a lot of things out. If you want to, feel free to visit the blog post for this episode. Just go to truthforteachers.com and you'll see the list of episodes. If you have questions for me, feel free to ask questions in the comments for this episode. I hope that I have told this in a way that you can see how everything I do now And everything I've ever done really grew out of my first love, which was sharing ideas that make teaching more effective, efficient, and enjoyable. The books, the speaking engagements, the online courses, the blog, the podcast, and now the club, everything came from that. That's still what drives my work every single day, making teaching more effective, efficient, and enjoyable. To me, it's like a giant puzzle that I'm putting together one piece at a time and just sharing what I discover along the way. I'm almost 20 years into my career now. I have no idea how that happened. (laughs) And I still have no idea what big picture all these little pieces are fitting into and what I will have created when I'm done. And somehow that's the best part to keep letting it all happen organically and just learning and growing right alongside the teachers that I love helping. I hope that this story has inspired you to also do the work that you love. If you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I could never do all that she's done. I actually don't feel inspired. I just feel super overwhelmed and inadequate. I want you to remember this takeaway truth. Long-term success is a direct result of what you achieve every day. You see, you don't have to know the complete big picture. I still don't. You just have to have a vision for what you want to have accomplished next. Think about what it is that you want to contribute to the world and what you want your life to look like and what the first steps would be to take you there. What's the most important thing you could do right now to make your vision a reality? Figure out your biggest priority and then break it down into monthly goals and then break it down into weekly goals. At the start of each week, break down that weekly goal into actionable steps for the day. And then you just show up. Look at that to-do list for the day and schedule each task into a slot according to when you have appropriate blocks of time and when you tend to feel the most productivity. Show up and get it done and use that vision to motivate you so that you don't fall prey to procrastination. Before you know it, that project will be complete. And then you'll know what the next step is. You will. You won't be able to miss it because all the work you've done up to that point will lead you to that next place. And you'll repeat that same process all over again. Break that big picture goal down into monthly goals and then weekly goals and then daily. And do small things each day to move you toward that vision. Long-term success is a direct result of what you achieve every day. So figure out what you need to achieve each day that will move you closer and closer to what you want. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy, 
it's going to be worth it. Truth for Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's edupodcastnetwork.com.